This podcast is produced by Visionary Studios. Hey everyone, I'm Mitchell Rail, and welcome back to Let's Unpack That. Before we get started today, I just want to tell you guys, we have some reoccurring hosts joining us throughout this season. One of those is my friend Sagar Jawani. Hello. Hi Sagar. So you guys may be familiar with him. He did an episode with us last season, but he's going to be making an appearance a little bit more regularly here on Let's Unpack That. So excited to have you here, Sagar. I'm very excited as well. Thanks for being here. So today we are joined by Noah Tayeb. Noah, welcome to Let's Unpack That. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. So for those who may Maybe aren't familiar with you. Do you want to give everyone a little bit of background on who you are and what you do? Sure, happy to. Um, so my name is Noah. I'm a 24-year-old uh, French boy who currently lives in Los Angeles, California. I moved to the U.S. when I was 17, so a few years ago now. I moved here after high school to go to school um, in the Bay Area. I attended UC Berkeley, and then I moved around quite a bit after that. I left the Bay Area after graduating to move to New York. Worked there for a few years. I was working in management consulting, uh, specialized in financial services. So very different from the work I currently do now as a full-time content creator. And then with COVID, my job got moved to remote fully. So I was able to move kind of wherever I wanted um, in the U.S. And I chose sunny Los Angeles. So I've been here for two years now almost. And in the process, also ended up quitting my job in consulting to pursue content creation full time. Amazing. Amazing. That's quite a journey that you've been on. (laughs) Yeah, going back and forth. (laughs) (laughs) So you originally are from France, correct? That's where you grew up. Yes, correct. Yeah, up until 17, it was Paris all the way. Love. So what was it like for you growing up there? And then what kind of led you to make that transition to America and move to America? It's kind of silly. I loved my life in Paris. And I think I grew up in like the most loving family. I had great friends. The city obviously is beautiful and great to be around. But I grew up watching these TV shows and movies that were like romanticizing college life in the U.S. And that's something that we really don't have in France. There's no school spirit. School is just school and it stops at that. And I was kind of craving something more that had to do with the experience about going to school and making friends and extracurriculars and learning things that weren't just school related. And there was also kind of like the prestige of going to a big university abroad. Um, I wanted to perfect my English because it's not my first language. And I really wanted to live abroad and kind of leave my family home to kind of figure myself out. And the U.S. was kind of the best option. When you you were in France, were you from a small town or was it from a larger area? Just curious. Yeah, I'm like from a small suburbs of Paris, like 20 minutes west of the city. It's very white, very privileged. It's like very much the idea of a suburb you would have but close enough to Paris that I got to experience it from a pretty young age. Did you have any like weird experiences growing up? Cause I mean, you mentioned like you probably, there probably weren't tons of people that look like you there. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny, especially now that I've lived in places that are so diverse and so liberal. I was like the brown kid in my school cause everyone was white, everyone was Catholic. There wasn't much diversity and being from a North African uh, background, I was kind of like, the diversity there, um, which is is kind of crazy to me now that I've lived in in such big cities. You've done New York, you did LA. Which one do you prefer? I will talk about them more, but which one do you prefer? Between New York and LA, I think I I loved both. I think having a corporate job, being in New York was probably the best because I had the like corporate culture and going to happy hour after work and just living in such a busy city when you're already having a busy life is great and a great place to thrive. I also kind of started my gay life and gay journey in New York City, Um, made my first gay friends, went to my first gay parties, and just really got a taste of what the LGBTQ plus community was like in New York City. So I think I will forever cherish that and the city will always have kind of that special place in my heart. I just can't deal with the weather. I hate the cold. I hate gloominess. I hate the rain. So I think I would have to say LA just for the living situation. Got you. So going back, so you graduated 
college and right after college, right, you have told me previously that you that you started a relationship. You were in a relationship at the time when you graduated, right? Yes. You moved to New York together and you were entering that scene, but you're in that relationship. So do you want to kind of give people a little bit of your experience on what it was like making that leap and also entering that new environment and new city but in that relationship rather than being single. Yeah, we're going straight into it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to give a little bit of, of, of background, I started dating this boy in college, so the summer before our senior year. Moved really fast. We moved in together, I think within a month and a half of dating into a little college apartment that was going to be our home for the next year. And then quickly we decided that we both wanted to graduate early because we had done the requirements and gotten the credits that we needed. So by December, we were already graduating after living together for three or four months. I always wanted to live in LA because I just was dreaming about the city and the weather, but he really wanted to move to New York. He was super into the whole corporate aspect of things. Um, He was pre-law legal studies um, while in college when we met and wanted to go into the legal field. So New York was just like his dream since he had like started hearing about the city when he was a kid. So we said, okay, let's move to New York. We'll probably end up moving to LA at some point, which happened, but we decided to do New York first. So we moved together to the city, moved into a beautiful apartment. We ended up starting both of our first big adult jobs uh, in the city at the same time. And we kind of built our routine around that. Like we would wake up together, have breakfast, and then both take the subway to go to our respective offices and then come back at night and either explore the city together, go work out together, eat together, meet people together. It was like very together all the time. We both also had kind of that craving of kind of discovering what gay life was like because in college, neither of us were out. I came out fully October, November of my senior year of college. And that's also the time that he came out to his family, um, his parents, which was kind of the last step for him too. Um, So moving to New York, we're like, fresh slate, let's start from the beginning and kind of figure out what gay people are like, because in college we really didn't have (laughs) gay friends. Let's discover some in the wild, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, but it's hard. And it's hard moving to a new city and being like, okay, I want to like infiltrate the community. How do you do that? My job, luckily, I'm, I was in finance, but also worked in kind of the most creative department of our company, which was called Digital. Um, of course, that's where all the gays were. So I kind of got to meet a couple of people in that department, uh, which made it really easy because they were just like the best and I'm still friends with them to this day. And then after that, we were like, how do we even meet new people? At his job, there was no one because legal um but we also wanted to kind of get out of the work sphere and meet new people so just like a lot of young gay people do when they're craving connection whether that's love or not we went on tinder and we were pretty confident and comfortable in our relationship at that point where it didn't feel weird and there was like no big trust issues uh, which i'm super grateful for and we just started swiping on people that seemed cool we like every time there was a group picture we're like okay he has friend let's do it (laughs) so we ended up swiping right on this Australian boy um, who has lived in the city for 10 years and just seemed to be the friendliest guy ever Um, his name is Sam and first message that Sam sends us after matching with us is welcome to the city I'm so excited for you guys to explore I'm having a housewarming party on Saturday I think it was like Thursday or something you guys should come and meet new people And so we did. We like took our little selves to that weird party in the middle of Hell's Kitchen, which if you're not familiar with New York, it's like probably the gay district in New York Um, and showed up to his apartment. We met him. There was like 30, 35 people and left that night with friends that I still have to this day and still love. That's amazing. It's so cool to have like such a great group of people and like to have that support system no matter where you live, I think is so important, especially in the gay community to have that core group of people that you can count on for sure. So you're working this corporate job, you're in New York, you're exploring the city with your boyfriend and having this great group of people to go out with and explore that, that place together. Do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of how you started to think about, Hey, maybe I don't want to live this corporate life. Maybe I want to make the transition away from that a little bit. How did that whole process come to be for you? 
So content creation was always a hobby for me. Uh, I think in high school, I started posting on Instagram. I was kind of like the annoying kid that was posting selfies and like just posting too much on social media for a high schooler. And in college, I started taking that a little bit more seriously. It was kind of my creative outlet. I was studying econ, but also business and entrepreneurship and marketing. And I was just super into branding and just the creative aspect of business. Um, So I kind of started treating my social media like that. I also started my YouTube channel in college because I was super into videography and wanted to make cool edits. So by the time I started my corporate job, I was already pretty established in my mind as a like creative boy uh, and always knew that I wanted to continue doing that. I think my following also had grown a little by the time I started my job and I had graduated college, which was a little weird showing up to the office and you meet all these new college graduates. It's kind of like the first day of school and people are exchanging social media and my following pops up and people start making comments or jokes or asking questions. And like, it was just the moment I started realizing that it was going to be a little odd to balance out, even though it was super small relative to what other creators are. How many followers did you have at the time? I think like around 40, 50K on Instagram. Okay. Um, probably like 20,000 on YouTube, which was probably what I was focusing on the most at the time. Okay. Uh, while having my, my corporate job, I was still posting one video a week. And I think I, I treated it a little bit as a creative outlet because being in such a non-creative field, uh, like financial services, it can get a little dry. And then a year into it, maybe two years into my job, I'm like, uh, I don't know if I can do this anymore. It was just a lot of long days. Um, if you're familiar with management consulting, it's like very long hours, really stressful projects with important deadlines and everything just seems to be top priority for everyone. Working weekends, working evenings, it's just like, it can be a little bit draining. And I just started feeling like my job wasn't giving me the purpose that I was looking for. I was talking to all these super wealthy CEOs about topics that were important for their business, but that I didn't really see the value in. Just credit cards, loans, and how to make the rich richer. And I was just kind of losing myself in the process. But I was still happy to do social media on the side. So that continued to grow, thankfully, because I was treating it as my creative outlet. And little by little, it got to the point where I was financially stable enough with just social media to be able to just say goodbye to consulting. And I don't know if it's a goodbye forever, but taking a little break from it. I feel like a lot of people have like a moment where like something clicks and they're like, this is it, like we're, we're, we're switching it up. Like, did you have that or was it really just kind of like you, you drifted into it gradually? I think there was definitely drifting from day one. But when I got fully remote because of COVID and started working from home and you get the ability to do a little bit of non-work related stuff during the workday, I think I got a taste of what it was like to build your own schedule and work on projects that you are passionate about. So that's when I think the click happened. I was also at the time on a very, very stressful project. Not to get too much, but I was like, I would catch myself hanging up the phone with my manager at the time who was a client and just bawling, like start crying just from how stressed I was, from how it wasn't even difficult. It was just the deadlines and the importance that these people put onto their work is very contagious and the stress was just a lot. And I think after this stressful project, I just told myself, okay, I'm going to give them a month notice. I think I gave them two months notice. I gave them a lot of time to replace me. A lot of time. Um, (laughs) Two months. You're like, hire somebody before I leave. (laughs) it, It was long and it was awkward too. We're having all these calls and like, I'm like, gotta go soon. (laughs) Give me me two days. But but it was such a good experience. I think my team was also great because I was in the digital department. Everyone was super, well, a lot more casual and a lot more fun than in other departments of my company. Um, I still talk to a lot of people that I used to work with to this day. And they were were super happy to see me do the transition from corporate to self-employed and entrepreneurship. Um, And I think I can still ask them questions or learn from them a lot, which is great. No, that is wonderful. And I mean, you then moved to LA, right? So was that directly, was that because you wanted to hit, you know, content creation full time? I moved to LA, I think I would say eight to nine months before I actually quit. It wasn't in my mind. Like I didn't have the plan. I'm going to move to LA and then I'm going to quit. 
I think I moved to LA because in New York, it was 2020. So New York was emptying out. Friends were going back home to their families and we were like, there's no point in paying $4,000 for one bedroom in a city that's like not doing much anymore. So we just moved to LA because I had been wanting to. And I think that kind of like kickstarted the beginning of going full-time on content creation and also probably kickstarted the start of a breakup. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually your boyfriend became your fiance. And mm -hmm. I think it could be noted as well that when you look back at your content, like this relationship was being captured to a degree in your content. So tell us a little bit about what is that timeline like? You're, you moved to LA, you're quitting your job, you're going into content creation full time. When does the proposal factor into all of that? When does that happen? The proposal happened... It's like very picturesque, very movie-like. The proposal happened on New Year's Eve, 2021. So we had been together for, can I do math? A little over two years, <laughs> two year, two and a half years. We were in vacation. We used to do Thanksgiving at his house with his family because my family's French, so we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. And then we do Christmas with mine. Um, so we'd go back to Paris and just celebrate with them. And then after Christmas, he planned a like New Year's trip to Switzerland in Stad, which is the dreamiest little city, well, not even a city, like a village in the mountains of Switzerland. Beautiful, snow everywhere. Um, so we were there for a few days, skied, used a spa. It was just very relaxing, very just the two of us and no one else. And on New Year's Eve, I think there was fireworks. I don't even know. I don't even remember. I think I backed down a little, but we're counting down for the new year. And then he got on one knee and proposed to me and everything got caught on camera because the sneaky little man asked me to vlog the entire trip because I was just vlogging at the time. Um, I love making travel videos and giving recommendations about best places to eat and visit. And he was like, we should film the, um, the countdown just so we have like a New Year's kiss. And I, he did it. I mean, we have the proposal on video and that got turned into content, which is kind of like the weird things with being a lifestyle content creator is that every aspect of your life can be turned into content, which is sometimes difficult to balance, but also felt pretty natural at the time. So proposal went up on, on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and the whole thing. <laughs> so, I mean, for starters, let's just say, I mean, Christmas in Paris every year sounds pretty amazing yeah. to me. Um, <laughs> and then like a, a proposal in Switzerland. Yeah, exactly. On New Year's Eve, when the clock strikes 12, like, it sounds like a literally like a, a Netflix like rom-com. Yeah. Like it literally is like, what a beautiful like moment to have. So you're, you're capturing this on social media. I mean, when you look back on it, how does it feel to have so many people so invested in your relationship? Because my life is still so intertwined with my content, I don't feel like weird about it. I think at the time, a lot of my content was related to my relationship, which is kind of like when you're in love, you want to tell everyone and you want to talk about it, etc. And I feel like that's what I was living at the time. I also came out on social media and a lot of my platforms turned into a safe space for LGBTQ plus youth to come ask questions and just kind of, I think, see themselves in, in me as someone who just came out and is exploring a new city, a new relationship. And naturally my content started being heavily focused on, on what I was doing and what he was doing at the same time because we were doing everything together. Looking back at it, I don't think I have any regrets. I don't think social media is the reason we broke up. Um, so I wouldn't blame it on that. I don't think it's like what brought us to an end. I'm grateful I have all these memories that I don't think I would have documented in like those formats and videos and pictures. So it's like, yeah, it's like a memory book that I get to, to watch over and over again. It's just online. And I think from sharing a lot of my life, a lot of my coming of age, a lot of exploring my sexuality and a lot of sharing my relationship, sometimes brought me 
in spaces and to people who inspired me a lot and who in turn were inspired by me. Um, so I'm also super grateful for that. That's great. I think it's so cool to be able to be like that representation and that like relatability and that guidance for someone else who is looking for someone to connect with. That's so cool to know that you like do that for people. I think it's really great to use your platform as a place to like really be honest and transparent. Like you do a really great job too. Just even like seeing your socials like in the past few months we've been like talking about doing this. It's like cool to see like someone who is being that that place to feel for, for others to feel a little bit less alone, which I think is so great and cool that you do. So kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. I, I think that's that's probably the best thing about social media as a career is I get to connect with people. I mean, I mean even you, we just met on social media and you get to kind of have I an mean, insight shout, into shout people's out, shout lives. Shout out to Shay. Shout out to Shay for making the connect. That's what I'm yes, about. So always. Shout out to Shay. Love him. Thanks, Shay. But uh, yeah, it is, it is cool to be able to connect with people and like through this podcast here to connect with so many people across the globe, like through the internet. Like, who would have thought that we'd ever be talking to like Noah yeah. or any of these people? Like it's it's cool. It's so cool to like feel like our stories are not all that different. But to get back on track, so you have this proposal. You are showing it to thousands of people on the internet. Give us a little bit of a timeline. Eventually, you break up and you have a breakup video at some point. Yeah. What goes <laughs> Damn, on? the whole process. What goes on between <laughs> there? And how did you process that both? personally, and then also determine how to reflect that on socials to the audience that have been following along in your relationship. Yeah, and I think that you're exactly like on on spot, spot on, because that is the trade-off. You share all the happy moments, and then once the relationship ends, and so much of my content was related to that relationship, so many people were telling me that they were inspired by seeing a young gay couple live a healthy relationship. You feel like you're letting people down, but going back to the proposal, we were engaged for about a year and a half before breaking up. A lot happened in that year, I think both in our lives personally. We're in young, we're in early 20s. It's the time to kind of double down in your career and chase your dreams and goals. And I think we were both dedicated to that. He was also in the Air Force Reserves, so in the military at the same time as he had his full-time job um, in legal. So I think it was five days after proposing to me in Stad, Switzerland, he flew to Alabama for a training for five months and he wasn't allowed to get off base. I wasn't allowed on base. So we just didn't see each other for five months after, after just getting engaged. Um, <laughs> That's quite a shift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, yeah. what is, so, and you're in LA at this point, right? So what's LA like yeah. when you have this relationship where you've got like the army boyfriend off at the base and the army you're, fiance. Oh, I'm so sorry. It'd be like an army wife. I was always joking that he put the ring on it before leaving for five months just to secure <laughs> his spot. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, behave while I'm gone. No, but um, <laughs> yeah. do you think that that was weird being in LA, which is a very like, I mean, it's a very gay city, of course, and you're there and you don't necessarily know like tons and tons of people there, but your boyfriend is, is with you, but he's off, you know, at the base. So how are you kind of inserting yourself into the gay community there or like each community in general? Honestly, those five months were kind of the time, the first time in our relationship where we kind of started to individually grow and figure out what it is that we wanted and that we liked, because up until that point, we were doing everything together meeting people, hanging out with friends, going out, everything was together. Um, and I loved that at the time, but I also didn't realize how much it could impact my personal growth. I was lucky enough that when I moved to LA, I already knew a couple of people. My best friend lived here. Just like I had these few friends that I loved and trusted. So when he went off to base for five months, I kind of focused on my friendships. I always say it kind of felt like we were single, not in the romantic aspect of things because we were FaceTiming and talking and texting and, and all the things. And I really got to do work, my hobbies, and hang out with my friends to the fullest, which I think was a great experience and really allowed me to go into the gay community of LA without feeling like I had to cater to someone or to be careful that he's having a good time. You have that five months apart. How did you kind of feel like your relationship, like, cause you were having this personal growth, you were getting this time apart, you were able to do your own thing without him for the first time for potentially like a year or so plus of your life. Did you kind of feel like your relationship was starting to change? You were kind of moving towards that space of breaking up? I, I don't know if we were close to breaking up, but I, we both definitely felt some distance growing between us. 
Um, that's also something that we were communicating and talking about. Um, we were super heavy on communication and just like, just not blind signing each other. But I was obviously missing him at the time too. So kind of battling conflicting emotions of wanting independence and discovering your true self, but also missing your person. We had just gotten engaged. Like I was getting ready to spend the rest of my life with this person. We were talking about getting a home, like just like building a relationship. And at the same time he's gone and I'm kind of figuring out what it is that I like and it's not necessarily what he likes. So naturally the questions of, are we meant to be together start coming up? And then he came back. So I was like, okay, we're yeah, back. Like, we're and back. So, like, so it's fine. So, it's yeah. like, what, so you have like what, like a year together, right? Where he's with you. Well, actually he left again. <laughs> so he came back, <laughs> he, he came back from Alabama for like a month and a half. And then after that had to be stationed in Santa Barbara. Good thing it wasn't that far and he could come back. So he was back almost every weekend, but I was still continuing to kind of slowly figure out my own life and get into my own routine and my own habits that didn't always include him. Um, and I think on his end, he was also figuring out what it is that he wanted and the kind of friends that he wanted and what he wanted to do with his free time. And it also didn't necessarily align. So he was in Santa Barbara until the end of 2021. So basically our first year engaged, not together. <laughs> and then after that, once he ended his assignment in Santa Barbara and came back to LA full time, I think that's when it went downhill. And from that point, it took probably three or four months until the breakup happened. So tell us about that. Tell us about that breakup, what that decision was like, and how you started to move past that period of your life. How did you process through that? <laughs> I feel like I'm in therapy. <laughs> after that full year of being separate i think we're both on that trajectory of focusing on ourselves our own, own careers so it's beginning of 2022 and he got a new job and started school at the same time and just was super super focused on reaching his goals and that was super time consuming but also i think his emotions and focus was on that which meant i was starting to be a little bit pushed back on the side looking back at it i can't be mad at him for that because we're in our early 20s and it's the time to work and like he's super goal oriented and I think that's what is going to make him feel fulfilled in his life but I also don't think that he really was in the space to be in a relationship or to be engaged because he just didn't want to focus on that and little by little we start kind of losing our connection he's working most of the time when we have meals it's separate we either cook or order food at different times it's starting to feel like a roommate relationship. And so that lasted for about a month. And then we decided to foster a puppy. Um, Hold and on, wait, sorry. So, wait, so, 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 so you guys are having issues and then you decided to get a puppy. You're like, the puppy will fill the void. <laughs> that sounds kind of bad. It's like these couples that are having a hard time so they get a kid or make a kid. <laughs> but we, we weren't adopting the dog. We were just, I, I mean, I love animals. He loved animals too. Um, and I had been following this shelter on Instagram who was just looking for fosters um, for puppies that were just rescued while the shelter is looking for their forever home. So for an adoptive family. And we were like, yeah, let's do it. And I talked to the shelter. They were like, yeah, it's probably between three, mo three weeks to like a month where you'd have the puppy. You just have to take care of him and like just give him love until we find him a family. Spoiler alert, the dog is now my ex's dog, so he adopted him. But it felt like it would just give us something to do together. And like, we just fell in love with taking care of a puppy. I just think he fell in love with the puppy and kind of realized that he redirected his love that he had for me for like towards the puppy because I don't think he was still in love. Um, so we're both fostering this dog together, but he's starting to get really attached to the point where he tells me he doesn't think he can give the dog up. At that point, I'm like traveling a lot for work, being out of the house a lot, and I just don't see myself adopting a dog. So we kind of have that pain point in our relationship where we're kind of disagreeing on, on kind of a vital like point. Adopting a dog is huge. It's like a big responsibility. And it's also, I think, kind of 
a long-term commitment that you make with a person. And I think that is what made me realize even more than the engagement that maybe we weren't going in the right direction and that we were going to break up because adopting the dog freaked me out and like made me feel like I was going to lock myself up in that relationship. And yeah, like a month or two after we had a really open conversation, which was emotional, of course, and there were tears and it mean, it's a breakup after almost four years of being together 24 seven, almost. What was that one year where he abandoned me? But it was just a very cordial breakup. And we just took the decision to to go with our lives separately. Thank you for sharing. And I feel like you, you, you really kind of gave us some vulnerable I'm, moments. I'm not there, crying. So sure. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really proud of you. This is, we, this is how I know I'm doing my job as your therapist. But um, I mean, so he gets, he, you guys, you guys, uh, you know, kind of, mutually decide like this is what we're gonna do uh you break up he gets the dog but did you feel like you had gotten anything out of that that you kind of move forward in your single life with or like what really what kind of what was your mindset like after after you've broken up like let's let's move forward a little bit from there the breakup itself i think was a long time in the making probably for like a year it had been like a thought in either of our minds but it's still weird when it happens like so much of our lives were connected to the other and social media is a big one like I can go on and on about how my career being so focused on my relationship also was me shooting myself in the foot it is difficult after being so connected for so long but at the same time I think I was also craving being single I have I had never been single at the time I went from I'm like a serial relationship guy like I was in a three-year relationship right before him for that, which started in high school. Uh, before that, I had girlfriends. Um, oh, wow, you really, like I, oh, okay. This is another three <laughs> sessions we need, I think, actually. But. but yeah, so I had never been single since probably middle school. And so I was obviously heartbroken about losing my person, the one that I was the most comfortable with and I felt like I could do anything with. But I was also super excited to explore that side of me, to do things without feeling like I'm, rely on someone else or have to take care of someone else in like a little selfish way. I was excited to just be on my own and figure out what that was going to mean for me. Do you have a moment where you were like, wow, like I feel like I've really grown or, or like, what would you say is like something that just really, I guess a moment in LA that resonated with you where you realize you changed, like you're not that same person who's like reliant on someone and you're like, you're not doing something all the time with someone else. Like what, where was that moment? And do you feel like you're thriving now? Like what, I just want to understand you're kind of Mindset. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely a work in progress. And I feel like that's a forever thing. I still have moments where I get sad and miss having someone that knows me so well and that I can do everything with. But I do want to say there's just a spontaneity about being single and just being able to do whatever you want and with whoever you want. If I don't want to come home tonight, I don't have to tell anyone. Or if I want to go on a trip, I don't have to plan anything with anyone besides myself. And there's some, a lot of freedom and power that comes with that. I don't know if there's a moment in LA where I felt like, oh, this is it. I've like grown from, from my relationship. Um, but I did go on a, my first solo trip recently, which I think was a huge step for me after being so, okay, let's say codependent. It was huge for me to be able to pack my suitcase and go explore a whole different city by myself. I think... I was also a little scared because I'm so used to being so codependent and to having someone by my side that doesn't make me feel lonely. It was also super exciting to be able to just wake up in the morning and be like, what do I want to do today? Yeah. And just go after it. No, I no, I feel like I've had like the opposite experience with you. Like, <laughs> I've been single my whole life. <laughs> uh -huh. Like I've always like Me, me too, actually. Yeah, like yeah. I've I've had to like <laughs> you know had to like accept and like em empower myself to, like yeah it's okay that I'm single and like I'm not gonna try to like find someone just to find someone but rather have the right person I mean it's clearly you've had luck with like finding the people that are like the right people but not had those like one week things where it's like yeah. oh, this is a waste of my time but like I think even for myself too like I've struggled with like how do I have time for me like how do I make that time for myself like doing things like going to see a movie by myself or going to like get dinner by yourself like I can imagine like being in relationship even for such a long period like having that codependency 
doing that for yourself can be even harder than like something like me. Like I'm, I'm gonna make that time to do something for myself. Let's go see a movie for myself, for my own, for my own alone time. Like how have you, like through that, doing that trip or just doing spending time by yourself, how did you really like process and like accept that this is okay to do this alone? First of all, props to you because I know how difficult it is. Um, he's like, he's like, you're it alone, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's okay to be alone. Like, it's not a bad thing. Like, society, yeah. society enforces the standard that you need to have a partner, whether that's a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever that may be. Like, it's, yeah, it's like yeah. our our community, the, the as the LGBTQI plus community. Like, I think a lot of people try to align their life with like the straight standard of having. A partner like you you need to have one to be to be happy and I think it's a matter of like normalizing that it's okay to be single like it's okay to have independence and like do things for yourself um and that's something that I've like really feel like I've kind of tried to like empower myself and like accept about myself this past year but anyways sorry turning it back to you like how did you go through that what was that process like for you I'm, I mean I completely agree with what you're saying about just the heteronormative society we have and all the goals that are associated with being in a relationship. I think a lot of my relationship and my engagement was just subscribing to the idea of being with someone. And that's kind of something that I'm still having to unlearn. And it's difficult because your emotions are involved and anytime your emotions are involved, your judgment is a little clouded. So going out by yourself and doing things by yourself is super hard, especially when you're used to being in a relationship and having someone to do it with. But it is about understanding the difference between being alone and being lonely. Um, kind of learning to <laughs> be your- line. I, I think I'm in, ther- I'm in therapy now, actually, what? <laughs> Jeez. Episode name, come on. <laughs> and yeah, I think, and I mean, it is scary to be alone and to have your own thoughts only and to be super introspective and to look at yourself in the mirror and spend time with that person because you're going to do it for the rest of your life. But it is empowering. And that's why I say props to you because that's something that I think people can go their entire lives just not doing and just finding partners or finding friends or finding a group that makes them feel safe and they can be great and you make connections and have great experiences and memories, but you kind of lose the whole aspect of what is it that I actually want to do and what is it that I am that you can get while doing things by yourself. I I, I can fully relate to what you both said, I think with, um, you know, just being comfortable with, with yourself. But I think segueing a little, I'm kind of curious, you you put a lot of your, your, um, relationship on social media, right? And you mentioned that. What would you say the reception was like when you made it public that that was kind of gone, like that relationship was not there anymore? What was the the theme of the response? Talking about the breakup on social media was one of the most difficult part of the breakup. Mm-hmm. Um, because my content was so oriented to my relationship and my sexuality. And I was getting a lot of these messages from younger people who were telling me they admired our relationship and it gave them the confidence to come out to their family or to go out and like date. And then this breakup happens and I feel like I'm disappointing my whole audience and that I'm kind of like breaking that image that we have built. Um, I don't think I wasn't being truthful on my social media with the way I was depicting my relationship. Of course, you only show the best sides because we're curating just a life to showcase. But it did take me, I think, two months to talk about the breakup on my social media. So for two months, I was, for a big part of it, still living with my ex and sleeping in the same bed and just not talking about it on social media. And little by little, people catch on and start asking questions, where is he? We miss him. Why are you never filming with him anymore? Did you guys break up? After a couple of months, that started to take a little bit of a toll on me because I'm trying to do the work to disconnect from my relationship and I feel like I'm making progress and I'm like not thinking about him all the time and kind of building this single life for myself. And then I open my DMs and there's people asking questions about my ex, which I can't blame them for because That's kind of what I signed up for, talking about my relationship so much. But I did come to a point where I was like, all right, I'm going to need to say something because I just can't keep 
getting associated to him and it's pulling me back mentally. And so I just decided to talk about it. The same way I talked about our relationship publicly, I kind of had to break that chapter in the same way. Well, I mean, I will say no. I mean, I can't even imagine, like, you're trying to process a breakup yourself, but then there's also, like, then you feel like you've kind of processed it yourself and then you talk about it online and then it's like everyone else is processing it and they're, like, coming to you and, like, you have to be emotionally stable enough to, like, be able to address them. And I can't even imagine, like, the mental, like... Pro- like the mental like responsibility and like the the like mental process that you must have had to go through during that like I can't even imagine like being in your shoes during that that's like a lot to like take on and like I mean proud to like say that you like that's like incredible to like have handled that, that's like going through two breakups not just one <laughs> it is but two it is <laughs> that's an interesting way of looking at but it's it like yeah they, they you process the breakup and then the thousands of people who were going through it with you then they have to break, then they have to process it with you and you have to be like that resource for them, which like, that is crazy. So like, I mean, that's, yeah. that's like, so you're like so strong to like, and resilient to like have handled that twice. So like, cause most people just have to handle it once and that can be hard Thank enough. You. Right. I, mean, I love hearing already, it yeah. that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to like also like piggyback on like your content recently. I mean, I will say, I mean, I think the way that you have reflected like, your journey being single and like normalizing being single and like I think really reflecting that it is okay to be single on your platforms I think is so well done um of course yeah I mean I think you you really do do a good (laughs) job of it and like really being so honest I think with social media a lot of times people are so dishonest and will show that like oh everything's okay like oh yes I just got out of this relationship but I'm doing fine but you're real, I feel like. I think you really do, like, be so open and honest with your, with your, with your um, audience, which I think is so important and so valuable in, like, a social media culture that is oftentimes so inauthentic that, like, you are bringing that authenticity to the table. I think that's, like, probably a big part of, like, why your audience is able to connect with you so genuinely and like it's so important that you're doing that so thank you for doing that because i think it's it's really thank a- you i'm getting an ego boost today <laughs> yeah no i mean i, I think it is important though, though. Like, and yeah. It, yeah especially in that I, I mean not to not that there's anything wrong with la but i think it's very easy to fall into that trap of like i'm gonna kind of conform to the standards of those around me especially yeah. in the gay community because a lot of our influencers look you know like it's a very similar yeah. culture a similar theme right and I, I kind of actually am curious because I, I feel like you are very authentic about yourself and and who you are and what you want to look like and I'm uh, on social media at least and and how do you feel like that has I, I guess affected the way you interact with your audience like do you has it has it been very positive do you have you ever gotten like hate for for just not for being yourself in a, or authentically I guess a hundred percent. I mean, it, it's social media. We, sometimes your profile ends up in front of people who aren't the kindest or the most interested in your life or your lifestyle. Um, so I think naturally the hate always comes. I think I was particularly lucky with my audience where people have just been so positive and supportive. I was freaked out about talking about the breakup because I felt like I was letting people down and like disappointing my audience. Um, but once I talked about it, I realized that people weren't as attached to the relationship as I thought they were and really cared about my journey and how I was coming out of that and how I was feeling. So I really have like, I think one of the most positive audiences, I really rarely get hate comments or messages. Of course, being LGBTQ plus on social media will bring you some hate naturally. I think TikTok is pretty heavy on that just because the way the algorithm is built your content just naturally ends up in front of people's eyes who aren't necessarily very friendly and let's say open-minded. Homophobia on social media is something that we all have to deal with being open and gay on social. I think the same way I kind of had to learn that resilience around my breakup, I had already learned a little bit through my coming out journey. Um, I always compare the two a lot um, just because they're very personal events that happen in people's lives that I kind of end up putting on display for the world to see and comment on. Coming out was scary, mostly because I was afraid of people's reaction and I was scared that I was gonna lose a part of my audience or that people were gonna be super negative. 
And the same thing kind of repeated itself for the breakup. But because I had that coming out journey before, I think I was kind of ready to take on whatever was going to be thrown at me. And yeah, it's, it's about convincing yourself that you're able to take on whatever people can throw at you just because they only know the part that you're sharing and there's some power and some agency in that that is very reassuring as a content creator. Yeah, I think that that's incredible, Noah. I think it really is like so great to have like that self-confidence and also just like that resiliency and like confidence to bring yourself forward. I guess to kind of go back to like the single era that you're in, like when mm-hmm. you, you know, got out of that relationship and you really started to focus on you, obviously with that comes to a degree like re-entering the scene and like re-entering going on dates and interacting with, you know, potential hookup culture, which you maybe hadn't been around necessarily previously. And I guess when you're looking at that hookup culture, you then are looking at yourself, your body image, what you look like as a person and really having to accept that, not just yourself and being alone, but like who you are and how you look because the whole world, the whole community, social media is looking at you for how you look. Both recently when you've been out of this relationship and also just throughout, you know, your social media career, what are things that you've kind of had to overcome when it comes to your your body and your body image, which I feel like is a lot, something that a lot of people struggle with in the gay community? Yeah, I mean, the gay community itself can be super sexualizing when it comes to our bodies. Being on social media is kind of doubling that because you're obviously putting yourself on display. I also know that I'm pretty guilty of just sexualizing myself with all the thirst traps that I post. Um, (laughs) So entering hookup culture, entering dating life and being on social media is like putting myself on display and I hear all the comments and people start to feel entitled to your body. Um, A lot of the comments that I've gotten since I think I like started social media was about my body hair. Being of North African descent, I'm naturally very hairy. And that's not something that is always seen as attractive. Not only in the gay community, I think everywhere we've always kind of put on these display these smooth, shaved men. The straights do it. But in the gay community, I think it's even more prevalent. We have gay people on social media. We have gay representation in traditional media. And hairy men aren't really displayed as like the sexiest thing. So growing up, when I started getting body hair, I was like, I'm not doing that. Started shaving everywhere, like every inch of my body. And was like, I can't be hairy. This is not cute. I don't want it. And then starting social media, I started getting comments about it. I would let my hair grow once just because sometimes I just didn't want to go through the hassle of shaving. And I started getting comments like, can you shave? Or like, I would lift my arms and people would be like, ew, like shave your armpits, that's gross. Um, on hookup culture, I'm, I've gotten messages from guys who were like, I'll only hook up with you if you shave your legs. And I'm like, that is just so odd. And it's also because it has been so normalized through years and years of media and representation that it's so difficult for people who have body hair to kind of accept it and find power in it. I just, I don't even remember when it happened for me, but one day I was like, I'm not shaving anymore. Like, I'm not gonna go through that. My chest is hairy and that's how it's gonna be. And since then, I think the comments have gotten a lot more positive. Um, People often tell me that it's what they like about my social media and that I kind of, I'm not afraid to show that men can be hairy and that that's okay and you can still look sexy. Um, But it was definitely something that I had to fake at first before being fully confident in it. Now my body hair is probably like one of my favorite aspects or at least my hairy chest. I recently started getting hair on my shoulders and my back. I thought I was done with puberty and that hair was just gonna stop growing in different places, but apparently not. So I started getting hair on my shoulders and. On my back, I don't know if you can tell, but I don't like it. I don't think it's cute. I I just don't think it's attractive. I don't like hairy backs. And a year and a half ago, I started doing laser hair removal because I was like, I'm not going to have a hairy back. And then I stopped myself and I was like, this is the exact same process you went through for your chest hair. And you're doing it again. So I'm letting my hair grow on my shoulders and my back. I'm getting the comments and getting people 
to tell me that they want me to shave. But I'm just going to ignore them until I fall in love with it and find it sexy and just I'll find power in that at some point. And I think when like someone really does embrace who they are and has that confidence, that's one of the most like attractive qualities. Mm -hmm. When when it comes to like actually someone who's worth your time, like even if it is someone that you're just hooking up with, like if they can't like be okay with you as you, like why even give them the time of day? Like even if I'm just going to like hook up with them quick, like do you really want someone who has a problem with who you are to be in your bed? Like, I mean, if... if yeah, I agree. But I also <laughs> feel like yeah. <laughs> we're just we're just so programmed to crave connection and validation that sometimes we just normalize those comments and we're like, "Oh, he wants me to shave. That means I would be hotter if I shaved, and that means that I would get his attention, and that's what I want right now in this moment. So I'll just do it." And it, it is stupid looking back at it afterwards, but. We, we all have these little moments of weakness where we're like just craving connection so much that we're willing to put ourselves on hold for it. But don't do it. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Don't do it. You, I mean, also like, no, like you are a beautiful person. So anyone who is making comments about your back, Thank you. keep boosting yeah. you. Yeah. But, but really, like if, if some man is saying that to Noah, like to yeah. anybody, Leave, like, yeah. anybody who's listening to this, like you are like, you're hot. Like everyone, we are, everyone is beautiful and has like their whatever that is makes them unique and amazing person. Like anybody who's making a comment about how you look or like some trait that you have that isn't good enough for them, fuck them. Like, sorry, like (laughs) goodbye. Like you do not deserve your time or my time or whatever, because like you should be valued and loved and appreciated for who you are. You shouldn't have to change who you are for other people or change your interest or what you're into to cater to the, the, the whatever you want to call it the, the generalized the I guess, generalized expectation. accepted yeah. expectations or what's accepted or what isn't by others because like there's there's so many there's so many people out there there is the right people who are yeah. going to accept you for who you are yeah. do you want people who aren't going to accept you do you want to feel like you have to fit into someone else's box like no. you should be able to have that self expression even if it's you know you worked in the corporate scene you should be able to express yourself in the corporate world you mm-hmm. should be able to express yourself when you're dating somebody like you shouldn't have to change who you are for somebody else yeah. I think that really is like amen, the, amen. <laughs> that was really inspirational I'm really on, I'm yeah. really on the soapbox today well I feel like everyone's just giving great speeches today I but but no no I like really do appreciate you talking about that I think it's something that the gay community does I mean we sp- we speak about it here and there but I don't think that we see a lot of mainstream stream creators like dealing with that or being open about it and just kind of moving through it. I think a lot of times we, we still end up hiding those sides of yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I've struggled with it myself, right? Like I'm, I'm brown, so I get it. Right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I've heard those same kind of comments and I think you realize like there is like people will appreciate you. You just got to find them. And mm-hmm. I'm, I hope that that's, you know, happening for you. I, I do want to say like, we're, I think because we're men and we just surrounded by men. There's just such a big focus on masculinity versus femininity and everyone has their opinions and everyone has their preferences, if you want to call it that. And I agree, like, it's not worth sacrificing yourself and putting yourself through changes that you don't want for yourself for the sake of other people. That's like, I'm talking about the body hair, which is considered to be a masculine trait. Could talk about how it's not. But on the feminine side, like I've also been in relationships where I was told by my significant other, I wish you were more masculine or like stop being so feminine. And in the gay community, there's a lot of that, of telling boys that they should act like boys, whatever the fuck that means. Um, uh-huh. but it's all the boxes. It's, it's, it's all, hard it's to deal with. It's like just trying to fit into someone else's standards. Always, yeah. And and it's difficult, but we just, I think, all have to learn to embrace ourselves. Oh my God, I sound so cliche. We have to embrace ourselves, like, not to please everyone, because that's just not going to happen. And your people will find you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Clip that. <laughs> your, your people will find you. No, they will. They will. Like, <laughs> it's just, like, it's just crazy. Like, I wish people could, like, just accept people for who they are rather than tearing them down. I think that's something a lot of the community goes through. Like people just love to judge each other and 
I mean, do what you need to do to feel hot. If you if you need to change something about yourself to feel empowered, do it. Like, do what you need to do to feel great about yourself, but like also accept yourself for who you are and don't change yourself for others. Do it for you. Yeah, do it for you. Not for others. Do what you yeah. need to do for yourself. Put yourself and, first. Yes, and there's also a little bit on the flip side. There's also a little bit of work that we all need to do to be more accepting of other people. Like, I I think we all find ourselves guilty of trying to put others like to put the perception that we have of others onto them. Um, being in a relationship, I feel like I felt that a lot. I kind of had this idea of my fiance and of who he was. And sometimes that can be a little limiting for them too, because they feel like they have to conform to the vision that you have of them. Um, so I think it's also important as gay men or as people in general to learn to see other people for who they are and then just accept that and if that's not the kind of people you want in your life whether that's i mean I'm t we're talking about body hair and femininity like if it's physical okay but if there's characteristics and personality traits or things that you don't want in your life then you can just move on to like there's no need to try and and change others exactly. in the same way exactly well, to wrap it up here a little bit, um, Noah, do you want to give any advice that you may have to people that are maybe struggling with confidence and they're wanting to be more confident and be more willing to live their authentic life? Um, what would you say to them? Yeah, I'm probably biased because obviously I work in social media, but I think we always talk about how social media can be difficult on your mental health because you compare yourself to others. You're shown a lot of conventionally attractive and hot people and sometimes it's not relatable or sometimes it's just not who you are or your community but I also feel like social media is a super powerful tool and to me it, it was such a big instrument in building this confidence because I started seeking out people that looked like me or that acted like me or that I could relate to and seeing their confidence or seeing the way they acted and the way they led their lives is what empowered me to do the same. Um, so I would say just venture out, find your inspiration. It doesn't have to be everyone's hero or everyone's crush or favorite model, but find the people that are living their authentic lives and that you feel like you can relate to and learn from them because I feel like learning from other people's experience is the best that we have to do and, and share. Well, thank you so much, Noah, for taking the time and being so vulnerable and honest with us. really appreciate it. I think it's so impactful for people to be able to hear other people's stories and how we all really are going through so many of the same things. Um, so thank you for the time. You're always welcome back if you ever want to come have for another therapy session. Yeah, I feel like I learned <laughs> a lot. Uh, I didn't yeah, expect didn't all that. We didn't even talk about semester at sea. Oh, we, okay, <laughs> we can say it quickly, but <laughs> literally, like me and Noah both did semester at sea, literally the best time uh -huh. ever it was so fun it's such a unique experience like literally sweet, sweet life on deck but real we'll have to have you back yeah. Noah, so we can unpack it full, fully this sure. at sea moment but for <laughs> those who want to check you out do you want to give everyone your socials and where they can they can find you yeah so you can find me on instagram tiktok and youtube my username is just noah tayeb my full name i was lucky enough to secure those and yeah come say hi <laughs> well thank you so much noah you guys can follow us on instagram at unpack tht and on tiktok at unpack that pod thank you sagar thank you noah we'll see you guys next thursday bye everyone thank you